This episode is brought to you by fingernails. Fingernails. You too can grow your own fingernails. Wait till the end of the video to find out how you too can grow your own very personal fingernails. Fingernails. Paid for by hands. The divisive feelings and uh, <clears throat> criticism on The Witcher's appeal hinges upon a bigger problem with ubiquitous media intelligent property. The Witcher was not as bad as its detractors wanted it to be. Far from perfect, sure, but not a travesty. The production value was top tier, the fight choreography was incredible, the tone was remarkably consistent, and the world building was immersive to say the least. But that's surface level. We'll go into the specifics in a second, but for now, I want to examine the show's response. It sucks that critics and some viewers quickly boil the show down to a turn your brain off experience, besides the fact that it completely undermines the points of criticism and by extension the efforts of those behind the work in question, the idea that any piece of art matters only when you've convinced your mind that it doesn't is completely asinine. Either you like something or you don't. As soon as you're able to distinguish between things that you like and things that you don't like, the sooner you can establish yourself as one with taste. Okay, first off, Geralt is a stoic badass, not so out of touch that he alienates the audience, and the idea of searching and maintaining his own humanity in a world that sees him as anything but that grounds his character, creating nuance that further establishes him as a compelling character. The duality of a larger than life personality who is also vulnerable to the world that fears and misunderstands him is a character trait that I have always appreciated, even in less than average storytelling. The show was a wave of subversion to the medieval fantasy setting, the most notable moments being episode 6 titled Rare Species. In this episode, Geralt, Yaskia, and Yennefer join a dragon hunt organized by Borg. This is a classic Dungeons and Dragons quest if ever there was one, but the kicker arises in the climax of the hunt, which reveals that Borg is a golden dragon who enlisted Geralt's help not to slay the dragon but to protect the egg. Episode 6 was based on Sword of Destiny, the second of the two collections of short stories. In most stories of this nature, we've been conditioned to imagine the dragon as a bestial force of nature, and this is exactly how they speak of it. The qualities of a classic adventure tale and the values which we are accustomed to hold is embodied by the knight who fights for kingdom and glory! His mindless madness is conveyed when he brutally kills a forest creature, an action for which there was never a need as the creature would have left if they had offered it food. The creature was a mere monster, and the knight was bravely fighting for the values which convention has held for ages, ones that paint the beast as villainous creatures of the night, and the handsome knight as the hero of the stories that are told through time. After camping overnight, Yennefer's knight escort is found dead, and on a meta level, this signaled the end of this baseless idea that we hold as truth, that creatures of the night are always wicked by nature and which paints humans as right and just with their dealings with such depravity. On a narrative level, it foreshadowed the subversive outcome of the quest. The Witcher is packed with unique narrative devices that can be truly appreciated, not to mention the death of the Queen and her royal court in the very first episode, which harkens back to the death of Ned Stark in the first season of Game of Thrones. <laughs> My gripe with the show isn't on how it's skewed from the source material or really the world that we're trying to build because as this was the first season, a writer should take his time in revealing all that which makes his work unique and should do so with the intent to be compelling and serviceable to the plot and not just because look how cool my thing is. My issues were with the characters of Yennefer and Ciri. First, let's unpack the characterization of Yennefer, as it seemed most of the story was focused on her development. I was behind her character when she was introduced, as cripples and broken characters are my Achilles heel, sold for a measly 4 marks to Tessea and inducted into the Brotherhood of Mages, it was a strong setup to an old-fashioned underdog story in a medieval fantasy setting. 
always weak, low and unappreciated, her quest for power was understandable and it was a motivation that was instrumental in her thematic narrative of controlling chaos. Because of how the world had treated her, there was a chaotic rage which built within, one that sought to destroy everything, even herself, if she could not control it. So as she was being reborn, it was made clear that in order to acquire the strength she desired, it would take away her ability to bear children. Seeing as power was her ultimate goal, to the point that she'd give up any future that was not in service of that end, her accepting of these terms was well within character for her at that point in the story. The issues for me came to light when she just decided to change her tune, when all of a sudden she wanted to have a child more than anything. There was nothing in her past that foreshadowed a healthy experience with maternity, her father threw her away while her mother watched. To Seiya, her mother figure was often cold and distant in her dealings with her. So what am I missing here? Let's take a step back and explore this. In episode 4, titled Of Banquets, Bastards and Burials, Yennefer having served Aiden for three decades, information they neglected to share, is escorting Queen Khalees of Lyria when they are ambushed by an assassin. Yennefer escapes with Khalees' newborn daughter but the baby dies in her arms. She buries the child and then monologues about the world being a terrible place for a child anyway. From the lips of one who was abandoned by her real family and often put down by her surrogate family to the point where she desired power more than anything else, this is quite understandable. But what about this single encounter with a dead child sells that motivation? Her words only go so far in explaining her unreasoned motives. She then goes on a bender where she manipulates kingdoms and ill-treats her friends in service of reaching the one goal that she herself had decided to give up for the sake of ultimate power. It really made no sense. It was at this point that whenever her character mentioned this goal, I would just sigh and roll my eyes because I had little reason to care about that plight. When she mentioned that she wanted everything, it all felt like a dream for dream's sake. And don't get me started with the weird time skipping that plagued the entire series. If you're adapting a story that you'd like to be judged on its own merits, you don't write it hoping that because the books or the games exist, the audience should know what happens at each point in time. It's extremely irresponsible. The Witcher is unfolding three primary narrative threads in three different points in time and it made it difficult to follow because we were never told where or when we were. Because the writers wanted to tell Gerald's classic adventures while simultaneously having Yennefer and Ciri involved, they jumped to and from all these events with reckless abandon. In addition, out of 8 episodes, they have 4 directors, which makes sense that it would lack the creative coherence necessary to tell such an already disconnected narrative. The first episode depicts Sintra's fall and the death of the Queen. These characters are brought back via flashback without warning or explanation. These flashbacks were so frequent that I couldn't tell where the present begins and the past ends. At which point in the timeline does Gerald meet Yaskir? Does he know him during the events of episode 1? You know what, maybe I deserve this because I'm the idiot who decided not to turn his brain off. <laughs> Siri was an on and off character for me. For a key character, she lacked the agency necessary to make her a meaningful aspect of her own slice of the story, which is not to say she was unnecessary. To put this further into perspective, let's talk about Arya Stark for a moment. After she escaped King's Landing, she went on an entire journey that explored who she was as a character outside of her identity as a Stark. She became a meaningful agent in her own story. And when she finally acted in service of her goals to avenge her family, we understood her character outside of that identity. I don't remember caring about Siri like at all. I mean, I empathized because I understood the point. This feeling slowly ate away from the dramatic tension of each scene. It's not that the writers didn't try to make me care, but it mostly felt like things were happening to her and that all she could do is react. It all felt like Siri, and by extension the audience was just waiting to be saved. Look, maybe this was all a part of her development, which is fine, I guess, I accept that, but it doesn't help that all I felt in every scene with her was nothing. 
The biggest issue with The Witcher is that for every positive, there is always a negative that not only hurts the overall experience, but also sticks out like a sore thumb when you actually take a minute. The thing is, it really could have gone either way, and we had no reason to think that it would have been the best thing since Game of Thrones, except that the writers played themselves and marketed it that way anyway. Though it could have been a lot worse, it wasn't cursed, which is another train wreck that I just don't want to get into right now. This is not a review, but The Witcher is a solid 6.5, which from my estimation is a positive score, but whatever, everything sucks, nothing matters, subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.